Nostalgia Critic Guy remember it so you don't have to. If there's anything Avatar The Last Airbender has taught us is that there's a yin to every yang. For every good there is a bad, and it's our duty to acknowledge them in order to keep balance. Considering how Avatar is my favorite show of all time, it only makes sense in honor of this philosophy to go over what many of you would probably see as a controversial issue, that of course being the bad episodes of Avatar. For no particular reason, I will now die. Let me go into a little bit more detail. In my opinion, there's really no such thing as a bad episode of Avatar. Even the weakest episodes have something of value and worth that goes beyond what's presented in most family-friendly shows. But if we want to acknowledge the best, it also makes sense to acknowledge the worst, so we can figure out how to continually make the art grow stronger. So I see no fault in looking over the not bad, but just not as good episodes of one of the greatest TV shows of all time. Uh, Critic, are you sure that's wise? Look, we're all adults, and we're going to talk about this in an adult way. So what's the problem? Just that when people see the word worst in the title, they might think the wrong thing. Well, that's technically what it is, isn't it? The worst of the best? I'm not afraid of a bunch of fanboys and fangirls, especially for a franchise I love so much. Okay. Shame your life had to end this way. I'll be fine, thanks. So, without further ado... Do you mind? I can hear you all the way in here. That's an even bigger shame. Shut up! Like I was saying, we're going to look at the top 11 not as good episodes of an all-around great series. Why top 11? Because I like to go one step beyond. So sit back and enjoy the top 11 technically worst episodes of Avatar The Last Airbender. In this episode, Zuka and Sokka try to break out the prisoners from their failed invasion by getting captured themselves and working with Suki to find a way out. In all fairness, very little is wrong with the premise, the development, and even the kick-ass action scenes that come from it. The problem is minor, but still a noticeable one. That being, why is there a part one at all? Seriously, this could have been just one episode. In fact, if it was, it could have possibly been the most tightly written, action-packed one there ever was. But instead, we get time dedicated to planning an escape from the prison, putting that plan to motion, and ultimately having it fail. Which, of course, leads to the second planning of an escape from the prison and a second attempt to put it into motion. That one succeeds, but, well, why the hell didn't they just edit the first one out then? Were they just short an episode so they decided to stretch one out a little more? Don't get me wrong, there's a lot of character, there's a lot of development, it furthers the story, but I think all of that probably could have been fit into one episode. Maybe with just a tiny cut here or there. I guess in some respects it's a bit more realistic not to have the first attempt succeed, but it's also realistic that Appa would most likely eat Momo at some point, but that doesn't mean I want to see it. When the episode finally does get going with the real plan in part two, it's great, it's a lot of fun. It's just seeing through part one that isn't bad, but isn't necessary either. Probably a nitpick, but like I said, this is the worst of the best, so you'll probably see a couple more. You happy now? I'm never happy. Number 10. The Serpent's Pass. Team Avatar has to pass through a dangerous route to get to the city of Ba Sing Se. After agreeing to take a pregnant couple with them and being reunited with Suki, the team try their best not to get gobbled up by a giant beast while also working out their emotional problems. Again, not a bad premise, but the emotional problems they're working through just aren't as engaging compared to other episodes. For example, Sokka gets overprotective of Suki because he has lost a loved one before. But we know how it's gonna end, right? He eases up as she convinces him that she can take care of herself. Just by getting captured later, but come on, that was like setting up bowling pins. Aang is still dealing with the loss of Appa, but we got a lot of that in a much more intense episode prior. So again, it just kind of feels like leftovers. Heck, even Zuko's problem seems pretty mundane. Just trying to get more food with Jet's gang on a ferry. Um, honor? Not that these are bad problems to focus on, but when you combine them all together and also throw in a mother giving birth, it's just kind of a slow one. 
Even the Serpent, compared to all the other great designs they've had on the show, is not especially that memorable. I mean, what was the combination of animals on that one? The dragon from Zelda 2 with a novelty map? By no means awful, but even as the slower episodes go, this one just felt really slow. I guess if that was the intention of the episode, it definitely worked. Nothing major. Number 9. Jet. Fresh off the last episode, Jet has a great moral with a great payoff, but kind of a less than thrilling character to do it with. Jet on the surface seems interesting enough. He's like a young Robin Hood trying to teach the Fire Nation a lesson, but goes too far when he tries to take out innocent civilians. This creates some interesting baggage for the character, but for the most part, he's just kind of a good-looking thief. He's there to throw another wrench into Aang and Katara's romance and mostly just be a good-looking foil. It's not that he has no character, it's just not very much. Again, by Avatar standards. It's not that he's annoying or unpleasant, it's just... We've seen the good-looking hero who, it turns out, is not the hero and has a stubborn side that's just never going to change. Most of us know it's coming, and we're just kind of waiting for it to take its course. While the moral it teaches about innocents caught in the crossfires of war is certainly a strong one, I do wish there was a slightly better character to get it across with. If he was even more memorable, maybe this could have been an even bigger deal. The kid equivalent of Magneto or something. As is, he's not bad. But like the episode proved, he's certainly not everything he was built up to be. Doesn't seem fair, does it? Number 8. Cave of Two Lovers. The romance on Avatar has always been one of the weaker points. At least for Aang and Katara, anyway. It's not that I can't see them together, it's that we have to go through a lot of the same cliches we've gotten in other romances where they'll always be overly awkward, which leads to a misunderstanding, which leads to them being angry at each other, and of course, leads to them both realizing they were wrong. Say, directed by Gary Marshall, and we got a wrap. In this episode, we go through most of that in a setting called The Cave of Two Lovers. On the one hand, I'm kind of glad all the romantic comedy cliches were kind of gotten out in this one episode. But still, I don't think you needed them to begin with. Falling in love is interesting enough without having to feel you always have to throw in this constant bickering. This continuing formula of the couple that argues all the time but then somehow gets together in the end. I mean, why does there have to be so much bickering in so many romances? Don't they know that's what marriage is for? We all know they're going to get together, so I never got why they tried to drag it out as long as they did. They can get together early on, there's nothing wrong with it. Have them be a couple afterwards, work through relationship stuff that would happen after you decide to be a couple. Come on, there's other areas to go with this. And granted, it's not office bad, but it has those romantic comedy trademarks that Avatar just seems to be above. But still, when a nice scene does play out, it does seem legitimately nice, and we do see Sokka deal with this world's interpretation of, well, hippies. So it's by no means a loss but I think this couple can definitely be strong enough without the Julia Roberts tropes. And God help you if you actually make Katara laugh that way. <laughs> Number 7. The Water Bending Master. After making their way to the Northern Water Tribe, Katara is horrified to discover that they don't teach women and girls how to fight, but only how to heal. So she faces off with the prejudice of Aang's new master to show sisters are doing it for themselves. I never know how to feel about episodes like this. On the one hand, yeah, there's always going to be people or cultures who are going to be prejudiced about anything. Gender, race, appearance, whatever. So it makes sense to stand up against that. On the other hand, isn't the message done better if instead of preaching about what you want to see, you just show it? Growing up as a little boy, I always loved Goslin from Darkwing Duck and Babs from Tiny Toons. I didn't care that they were girls, and that's because the show didn't care either. They were just funny characters that were part of the group, so I never had any problem with them. However, when the trope of girls proving they can do what boys can do comes in, I always feel like it's making the character more a statistic than a person. And Katara is definitely not that. Neither her gender nor any prejudice against her was her identity, so this plotline didn't seem especially needed. As a kid, if the people in the world you love accept something, it's more likely you're going to accept it too. But, again, on the other hand, we do know all this bullshit does happen in the world, and there's always going to be idiot douchebags out there who enforce it, so it's probably good to be prepared for it, right? 
It's hard to say what the best route to take is, but with this episode, we all know exactly what that route is going to be. She's going to win him over, and of course, he's going to teach her in the end. Even if you are going to take this road, isn't there a slightly different way you could do it? Some variation, something we didn't see coming? Oh well, we did get some great waterbending action, great shots of the city, and hey, it's still these great characters being great characters. I guess all I'm looking for is a little bit more variety in the message, or at least the teaching of the message. But again, I still got to see Katara do what Katara does, and it's pretty awesome. So I can't complain too hard. You can't knock me down! Go, Katara! Number 6. Sokka's Master. This actually ties into the same argument I had with the last one, only this time it's a bit of a different prejudice. Sokka feels bad because he's not a bender like Aang, Katara, or Toph. Because of this, he feels totally useless. So he finds a master to teach him the art of sword fighting and being a great fighter. He even manages to put a sword made from a meteorite together. So now he never has to feel left out ever again. The strange thing about this episode is that through the previous seasons, they've tried to convince us Sokka had a point. And in my opinion, they succeeded. Sokka was more than just the comic relief. He was the idea guy, the one who thought out of the box. The one who at times could be a little too nutty, but always came through with what he needed to come through with. He even already had a weapon, his trusty boomerang, and we all associated it with him. So the idea of acting like he had no part in everything that was going on didn't seem necessary. He was important, not just for laughs, but for strategic planning. And he was good at it. Great, even. So this whole episode about him trying to feel redeemed and valuable didn't really pay off because we already thought he was. Again, it's drawing attention to a prejudice you probably weren't prejudiced against and possibly didn't even know was a thing. Sokka's fine, no improvements needed. It's almost like the creators were anticipating a backlash for him that, as far as I know, never came. Who can't love Sokka? Sokka's great. Never change for anyone, big guy. Keep it real. Water tribe. Number five. In this episode, but many of them don't turn out coming very far. Past, present, and even future.